Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, um, y'all are lovely, but uh, I am <laughs> going to be looking down uh, at my notes here periodically. Um, hi, everyone. I am JP, and I'm going to talk to you about something I built called PlaySki. PlaySki, or Playable ASCII, if you like, is a free and open source ASCII art, animation, and game creation tool. It runs on Windows, Linux, and for now, until Apple finishes locking down their platform, Mac OS. Um, and you can see the URL to, my, to the page on my website there. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep this as jargon-free as possible, but I wanna unpack some important acronyms up front. ASCII is a standard for representing text characters on a computer. ANSI is a standards body that introduced a specific set of these characters for the IBM PCs back in the 80s, and people sometimes refer to this as ANSI art. But if you're new to all this, uh, you can treat ASCII art, ANSI art, and text mode art as interchangeable. So I built PlaySki as an ASCII art tool with an eye towards expanding it to be a game engine, which is a bit weird, and I'll talk more about that later. Now, to be clear, this talk isn't so much about here's my hot stuff technology, everyone should be using it. This is an odd little homebrew project that I did because I really wanted to. I learned a lot, I'm proud of it, and I enjoy using it. And I'll talk about this more at the end, but I think the world would be a better place if everyone could afford to do something like that. So first a bit about ASCII art and what drew me to it initially. I don't like games being an island culturally. Broad influences are very important for a growing medium. So I like to think of things that we all do as connected to much older traditions that often predate digital games. Pixel art came from mosaic and weaving and needlepoint, et cetera. And ASCII art arguably originated with pictographic languages such as Egyptian hieroglyphs and later concrete poetry, et cetera. As long as humans have been writing and drawing, we've been communicating interesting things by blurring the lines between those two things. Typewriter art is what happened as soon as we got machines that could print text with the press of a key. The immediacy of that let people play with text as art way more easily than, say, like movable type, which I guess was the prior technology. And so at the dawn of the computer age, text characters were your graphics. Every computer had a character set of all the possible glyphs that they could draw. And so, for example, emoticons were just people improvising within the constraints of that character set. And people obviously wanted to make images, but they had to get creative. So character sets on the microcomputers of the late 70s and early 80s got these special glyphs called semigraphics, things like little blocks and wedges that let you draw pictures. And this is a famous Commodore 64 program that just generates a little infinite maze out of those semigraphics. In the BBS era, this stuff flourished as ANSI art. And this became the primary medium for branding and art in these pre-internet digital spaces like bulletin boards. ANSI made sense because while computers soon had the ability to draw pixel or raster graphics, as they're sometimes called, transmitting them over a modem was almost always massively slower. So when home computers became networked, they kind of got busted back down to pure text mode art for a bit. Uh, also around this time, there was an ASCII-based game with a built-in level editor called ZZT, which I totally missed. I think I was too busy playing Wolfenstein 3D at the time. But this little game ended up being enormously influential for a lot of people, and for decades down the road, and it was an early seed for the concept of game mods and having flexible enough technology, a game engine, to support that. And so today, ASCII art or text mode art or whatever you want to call it is just another widely recognized aesthetic realm within visual art, much like all the different kinds of pixel art you see. It's a medium. And about 10 years ago, I delved into this and started noticing cool work by specific artists, and I got inspired. And I wanted to mention a few whose work I really connected with. So Raquel Myers is a German artist, and her work is very bold and graphic, and it crackles with this kind of punk glitchiness. She does all her work on a real Commodore 64 computer and typing it in character by character, which is just amazing. Isla D is an illustrator, and her figures and use of color have this playfulness to them that I think stands out from what we normally think of as text mode aesthetics. Uh, Polydux is a veteran pixel artist and game dev whose work draws from a lot of different traditions within pixel art. And Datador does a lot of work with custom character sets, which gives the, uh, the work this kind of intricacy and mystery. So I started delving into ASCII art and realized that I loved it a whole lot. And also around that time, I saw a talk by Brett Victor called Inventing on Principle. And I was like, hmm, I should try making tools sometime. So just for fun, I made a tool called Edski over a long weekend in 2012. 
and it was a basic ASCII, it was a basic ASCII painting program, but I also added this ability to convert bitmap images, and I really liked the way that that looked. I don't want to go into de detail about it now, but if we have time at the end, feel free to ask me about how it works. So to break down some basic concepts here, a piece of ASCII art uses a particular character set and a color palette. A document is simply a grid of tiles, and each of these tiles has a character, a foreground color, and a background color. And each of these are represented by numerical indices into a character and palette table, respectively. So this is the underlying decomposition of all ASCII art. So a few years later, I wanted to make a game on my own, a roguelike-like-like, or a roguelite, or whatever, you, whatever you all call them. Um, and since around 2007, I had wanted to, quote unquote, go indie. And even though by 2015, the window of opportunity really felt like it was closing, I still wasn't ready to give up on that dream, even though I maybe already should have. Anyways, I wanted to make this game, and ASCII seemed like a reasonable way to make a game that was both visually distinct and within my artistic capabilities, so I started making PlaySki. Um, I used Python again, and I learned OpenGL and SDL2, so all the hard platform level stuff was basically already done for me. Uh, one reason that ASCII appealed to me was that it was a way of making art that reduced and discretized the total number of decisions to be made on a page or a document, canvas, whatever. It's easier for me to start drawing something when there's a finite enough set of possibilities that I can see them all, character and color combinations, in front of me at once. And this also gains some of the same advantages of tile-based level editing. And indeed, PlaySki can be used as a tile-based level editor. Uh, Jim Stormdancer used it to lay out the overworld map for Frog Fractions 2. Not that Frog Fractions 2 is a real game that anyone can play. Um, <laughs> there are already a lot of great ASCII editors out there, like Rex Paint and Pablo Draw, and one for the Commodore 64 called Simply Petsky. I made my own editor rather than use any of these existing ones because I wanted to be able to have weird things like layers, alpha blending, post-processing for things like this cool CRT filter, uh, and a game engine built in where objects could move off grid and do all the stuff that game objects do. This all made it less of a pure retro, could exist on a real old computer uh, thing, but that wasn't really a priority for me. If I wanted something really authentic looking, it's easier to create that in a more powerful program and write a bit of code to export down to the simpler format, uh, was my opinion. But I also had my own ideas about user interface that I wanted to put into practice. So if you hadn't already guessed, these slides were built with and are running in PlaySki's game mode, which allows me to do a bit of a live demo and first a brief overview of art mode, which I'm going to switch over to now. As you can see, there's a menu bar along the top, um, a status bar. Oh, it's, I guess it's cut off by the, uh, on one of these TVs. Anyway, yeah, hopefully, okay, cool, yeah, you can see it. Um, yeah, there's a menu bar along the top with conventional pull-down menus and a status bar along the bottom showing the character and colors that you have currently selected. Um, paint operations preview under the cursor, so like this is what I will get if I click this. Um, and I can, you know, do things like copy, paste, and select, and, you know, um, and undo and all that good stuff. Um, and I brought back Edsky's concept of a character and color selection pop-up uh, so that you know you have instant access. You just tap the space bar and you can have access to all of the different foreground and background colors that you want. You can paint around with that different stuff and you can sample a character and all that. Um, except now you can dock it and just leave it as a persistent UI element. So, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit of art mode. Um, I care a lot about this idea of tool flow. Um, but what that actually means in many situations is finding operations that you do several times a minute but are high friction, such as ones that take a lot of clicks or dragging stuff around, and I try to work out a design that reduces that by as much as possible. But I also weigh the cognitive cost of UI actions. What am I being made to think about? When do I make decisions? How many decisions do I have to make? And how many UI concepts do I have to engage with for a given operation? I also care deeply about approachability. I don't know if there's a more official lingo for that. And I avoid the word intuitive because much like flow, it can be amorphous and baggagey. PlaySki's starting document here, which is what I've been painting on, gets new users past a blank page and immediately invites them to play with it. There's even like this bottom edge that invites you to like pan around and scroll past it and understand that documents can actually be of you know, arbitrary size. Um, 
that said, this is definitely not a so simple, a five-year-old could use it kind of tool. It's targeting a specific level of expertise, but hopefully the on-ramp to that is as simple as I could make it. I also wrote a whole user manual that's included with the program and opens, if you're, it opens up in your web browser just for that reason. And because I think any program that's breaking conventions or mixing paradigms like this should have, should have one. So, like I said, old 80s microcomputers each had their own character sets and color palettes, and I was eager to add all of them to the selection available out of the box with PlaySki. I quickly found that these have a massive effect on the kind of art that you're making. Each character set and color palette have their own personality, and it's hard to put into words. You just kind of have to work with it for a little bit, and these are some examples of like, you know, things that people have done with radically different you know, types, of, uh, types of things. It feels a little bit like, it feels like a mix of using different fonts, using different tile sets or textures in a level editor, and writing in a different human language. So it simultaneously tickles both our language brains and our visual brains, and I think that's one of the amazing things about ASCII art. So from the start, I knew that I wanted PlaySki to use real-time 3D rendering and handle input and have a simulation loop, much like a game engine. I didn't initially think of it as an engine, but I might as well own up to it. I made my own engine. It's the first one that I've made, and I tried to put into practice a lot of what I had learned and opinions that I had developed over the years of working with a lot of different engines, Doom, Quake, Gold Source, Unreal, Double Fine's Buddha Tech, et cetera. And specifically, I wanted a game editing tool with a strong, en strong emphasis on, as I'll call it, liveness and dynamicity. So someone I mentioned earlier, Brett Victor's work expands upon this dramatically. And to be honest, I think I've only just scratched it with PlaySki, but it's a major idea in any future tools work that I do. This idea of tightening feedback loops, seeing things that are hidden or hard to visualize, seeing all the way through a process instead of just one step ahead and seeing across simulation time or production time. And sometimes it's as simple as facilitating an instant connection between a piece of art and a game object, between a tuning value and something it affects, between collision simulation and visuals. And I thought back to my time designing Quake or Half-Life maps when making a small change to a map often meant waiting several hours for it to recompile. Modern big budget tools still thrive on big expensive bake processes. I don't know, it makes all of us feel important or something. And I wanted the opposite of that because for Pete's sakes, it's, it's, it's ASCII. Uh, so I tried to ask, what are the turnaround times on a given action? What requires a compilation process? What requires a reboot of the engine? What requires just a, even a quick load? So as an example, um, in PlaySki, the art that a game object refers to is the same data object that you work with in the editor. So I can easily select this animating object here, and I can open up its art and pop back into game mode, and then I can, uh, I can make a tiny little change to it. Let's make this owl's eyes like big. Um, yeah, and I can just flip back to game mode and without even saving the file, I can see that it's there. Um, yeah. So, um, so other than thinking about uh, as carefully as I could about overall architecture, I tried not to freak out too much about performance and avoid engaging in the dreaded premature optimization that everybody tells you to avoid. Uh, for example, in the architecture of the original Doom engine, moving the floors and ceilings of any given room was basically free. And as a direct result, level designers used that a ton to great effect. Anything could be an elevator, any floor could suddenly collapse out from under you, walls could appear to tumble down, and staircases could, could rise up out of the floor. So for PlaySki, one principle was make as few speed-related restrictions on behavior as possible, and the ones that are there should be easy to, fit, easy to lift. Um, this focus led me to other things like hot reloading as much external data as possible, such as character set and color palette bitmaps. Eventually, I'd like you to be able to edit those from within PlaySki itself, just because that makes sense. Also, maintaining a very thin separation between art mode and game mode. Nearly everything, including the editor UI itself, is modifiable at runtime, so that you have as few reasons as possible to actually restart the entire program. Um, I also added a Quake-style pull-down console that exposes the Python read, evaluate, print loop, and some other special case commands, so you, know, you can just do all the stuff that you would at a normal Python console. Um, <clears throat> some other miscellaneous stuff about game mode. Games that you make within it are written in Python, same as the program itself, and loaded in as modules. There's very little protecting the engine code from game code. I just assume that you know what you're doing. Don't run PlaySki games from people that you don't trust. Um, 
any of this code can modify a game's object's art at runtime, so you can do things like procedural animation. And actually, uh, back in art mode, you can run Python code on your art documents. Um, so for instance, I can switch, yeah, I can switch back, and then I can run uh, a cellular automata uh, thing on this starting document one step at a time, or I can have it run continuously over game simulation time. Um, yeah. So, okay, and yeah, we're, we're, we're deep into live demo th thing here. I also ended up writing my own collision system, and I'm gonna open up the first game, uh, or game-like thing that I made um, using, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that I, this, this was the first thing that I made to prove out. You know, I basically used, I converted Chrono Trigger sprites to, uh, into ASCII version, cool looking ASCII versions of them. And I, uh, I have debug visualizations of the collision shapes, primitives like circles and rectangles, but also uh, being able to paint specific tiles within a given piece of ASCII art as collision. Um, and then yeah, I can also just click on objects and live edit their, their properties. Uh, and just, yeah, make an extra wide thing. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, uh, I, so I also, I, after this, I tried building something with a larger world, and I realized that I needed a, to add this concept of rooms that let you organize stuff and manage the scope of the simulation and rendering. Uh, yeah, there it is. Um, so yeah, here's a very ZZT-like example game that I made. There are multiple screens, there's a little town over here. Um, and I'm gonna cheat ahead and give myself a key that will get me past that lock on the screen. Go back into edit mode, drag this over, and then, yeah. Um, and now I'm just gonna select the player character itself and drag it over to here. Whoa, geez. Um, oh geez, yeah, I'm outside the, all right, so I, I kind of skipped past. Uh, <laughs> All right, nope, nope. Wow, well, my, my little, uh, my optical mouse here is just freaking out on this wooden table. I think. Um, okay, so yeah. So we'll get through this little lock and key thing and we're gonna claim this artifact. Um, and hey, actually, it's just randomly cycling through all the different characters that are in the character set, so the fact that it landed on the at is maybe especially auspicious. Um, anyway, yeah, so now we're at the end of the little example game here and it puts you into uh, this flying mode where you can see the entire world laid out in a 3D perspective. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's game mode. Um, okay, yeah, let's, let me get back to my slides here. Uh, <laughs> which should just be, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, yeah, we did that. Um, so the choice to write one's own engine uh, versus use an existing one is so often framed in terms of expediency versus programmer ego and autonomy. The autonomy part is only part of that for me though. For me, it was actually about being able to put different values into practice. Um, and I would say it's this more than anything that has made working on PlaySki worthwhile and enjoyable to me. Some broader context, um, so many people are making games now and our needs, I think, have never been more diverse. But at the same time, much of game development now is dominated by the Unity and Unreal duopoly. And these engines often don't share our values. They're fundamentally tools for converting money into content, you might say, a sort of industrialized distortion of the practices by which the earliest generations of game developers built our medium. And these tools are in many ways designed around their business models. And I think we'll increasingly find ourselves prevented from using them how we would prefer to, renting them instead of owning them, and in general being made subjects of the platform capitalism that cr their creators espouse. And that's not really the world that I wanna live in. So I think we would all be very well served by a flourishing of these kinds of smaller tools, each with a unique creative identity, a tighter focus, an unusual new way of doing things, or a commitment to being approachable in specific ways that empower new creators to develop new things, tools with different values. And the good news is, lots of people besides me have made small, weird tools like PlaySki, and I think we may well be in the early stages of a renaissance of small tools. Search for tools on itch.io and you'll find tons of amazing stuff. And in a lot of ways, big tools try to be all things to all people. But I've come to believe very strongly that if everyone made one thing that wasn't for everyone, there would be plenty of something for everyone. And I think that goes for not just tools. 
So yeah, artists have made a ton of cool stuff with PlaySki, and seeing it is always incredibly inspiring to me. I try to post everything that people send me that they've made with the tool to the PlaySki Tumblr or Twitter accounts. This is a Russian artist who goes by Nun Petrovich, and this work was tiled out in PlaySki and then colored in the paint program Krita. And yeah, yesterday Andre Int mentioned that for his game Nauticrawl, he had commissioned some text mode art from Polydux and run it through PlaySki for displaying on the screens in its 3D world. And people have used PlaySki to make art for album covers, and art for games, ASCII and non-ASCII alike, and art for gallery exhibitions, fan art, music videos. And yeah, when people send me this stuff or I stumble across it, it just floors me. Because here's the thing, if you make tools, people will make stuff with them, people with talents utterly unlike yours, and you'll be amazed, and you'll feel proud in a way that's kind of like what I imagine being a parent is like. This, this artist's talent produced this, but I helped enable it in some small way. I was there in the background, humbly handing over just the right paintbrush. <laughs> this is a photo that I took one evening in February four years ago, across town in Presida Park as the sun was going down. It was one of the first images I ran through Playski's bitmap image conversion code as I was putting the finishing touches on it. And I really liked the way that it looked. And I remember feeling really proud that I had made this weird little tool, this unique way of creating images. It was like learning a new song, and I wanted to share it with others, anyone in the world, for free on the internet. And I started off with this, wanting to make a game, but it was good that I set that dream aside for a better one, I think. And that comes back to why I did this. Building a tool for creative work is a specific kind of social act, a political act. You are opening, new door, opening doors for people to make new things, and sometimes for new creators to start making things. And once I started doing that, I found it fulfilling in ways unlike anything else I had experienced in my career to date. So I don't really care if I never work on another critically acclaimed game again. I want to spend the rest of my career building tools and enabling others. So again, I'm not saying use PlaySki. I'm saying build something like this that echoes your values, whatever that might be. PlaySki was just my first step. Show me what yours is. Thanks, everyone. My website is vectorpoem.com. You can get PlaySki from itch.io, and my code is hosted until June of next year, at least, on Bitbucket. And hey, follow me on Mastodon. It's better than Twitter in a lot of ways. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Do, do, we have, do we have time for questions? Cool. Any questions? Yes, please. Hi. Thanks. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. I had a, so suppose that I make an animation or a piece of art, probably specifically an animation in PlaySki, and I'm developing a game um, using some other technology or rolling my own engine in that. Is there some sort of standardized format that I can use for exporting PlaySki animations and like playing them back as sprites in, in my game? Is there a rendering engine I can bind to or? Yeah, you can, um, so yeah, PlaySki has a native uh, internal format that's JSON based. So it's very easy to just to, to take the native format and parse it into whatever sort of thing you're doing. But it does also, um, yeah, you can export it to a bitmap. You can export it. I, I, I don't export to sprites currently, but there's an import export plugin system that you know I could you could write something for. Um, but yeah, just being able to export to PNG images or just anything like that that you want. Um, and then yeah, you can also export to legacy formats like uh, you know the ANSI format. If, like I think somebody was running a BBS and they you know, had like a, they were able to author some of their stuff in that. So yes, definitely, I, I definitely wanted to make sure that people could use this to create, yeah, stuff that they could then ship off to other engines, technologies, you know, printing, whatever. Any other questions? I have a question. What's the most surprising thing you've seen someone make with PlaySki? Um, Gosh, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, somebody, an artist in Prague uh, that, who, that I think showed up on one of the slides um, did some analog paintings, you know, and then they converted it and sort of put that, put the different ASCII conversions alongside their, their original painting as sort of this exercise in visual deconstruction and whatever. Um, I really wasn't, you know, I was definitely expecting people to make cool retro stuff with it, but seeing it cross over into fine art was, weird and cool. 
Um, hey, I was really inspired by this talk, and I, I was wondering, actually, what are some of the tools that you're inspired by or that excited you or that have informed your, your tool making? Yeah, um, I guess... Uh I guess it's easy to, you know, I, I missed it back in the day, but sort of going back to it and reading about, you know, how it had, you know, uh, developed uh, this whole community around it. ZZT was definitely one of those. Um, you know, I've been involved with mod communities for most of my life, so actually just, um, yeah, like Doom level editing tools, you know, which there are contemporary Doom level editing tools that are, you know, kind of cool and modern and stuff. Um, I'd have to think about that actually, because yeah, I just sort of voraciously consume interfaces and tools and stuff. So yeah, I, but yeah, I think that would it would be good for me to put a list like that together and maybe yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember if I have. Oh yeah, well, I mean, general tool inspiration, maybe not so much specifically for PlaySkey. Uh, I used HyperCard back in like junior high, and that was like yeah, that was eye opening because it was like. Yeah, you know, because I wasn't a computer programmer. I didn't, neither of my parents, like, had, were able to, you know, connect me to, like, an engineering education or anything. Uh, so, yeah, HyperCard. Kid picks, absolutely. Yeah, my sibling uh, had that back in the day, and I remember messing around with it, uh, with them. And, yeah, like, yeah, I mean, just those sort of radically accessible tools, and then also tools that are off doing, like, a super weird specific thing, I think uh, are equally inspiring. Hey, so I've uh, known about uh, PlaySki for a while, and I've seen a lot of art done with it. I didn't realize it was a, a game engine as well, though. Um, and I noticed you were like showing off a lot of the art and, and visual aspect sides of it. But I'm curious, uh, like, what the actual game is? There a game development community around it? Like, what sorts of interactive things have been made with it so far? Um, I've made a few small things that I've released on itch.io, um, but yeah, like, I don't I don't know of anybody else who has shipped a game with Playski's game mode, um, and it was uh, that, that I'm not disappointed really by that. It was basically just like I'm going to make this weird thing, and I'm going to try to make it as accessible as as I can, and I'm going to write documentation and like make sure that it can auto generate the documentation about all the game mode API type stuff. Um, so yeah, there's nothing that I, yeah. A lot of people have made art for their games that are Game Maker or Unity or whatever with Playski, but um, but yeah. And yeah, I don't, you know, th th that's the premise of this talk was very much like, oh, I want all of y'all to start using the game mode on this thing because it is, I am basically just inviting you into my home code base. And I don't, and I, and I always want to be realistic about like how horrifying and weird that's going to be. I mean, I, I try to write good, comprehensible code and stuff, but you know, uh, yeah. Hey, well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.